Good evening, everyone. I'm Joseph Cotto. And before I say another word, do you want to understand the world around you and maybe even yourself a bit better than you do now? Are you looking for answers to some of life's greatest questions, even if they are the most difficult ones? Maybe you just want to learn something new. In any case, online great books may be just what you are looking for. When you sign up for a course there by following the link below, Cotto Gottfried gets $45. Learn about the past, present, on our inside, and the future by learning at online great books. Knowledge is power. Joining me today is someone who's not been on the show in quite some time, but I'm very glad to say that he is on this evening. Uh, the one, the only Luke Ford, who obviously has won a hell of a lot of knowledge. Luke, how's it going? Joseph, uh, good to uh, talk, good to, talk to you. It's been a little while. It has. Yes, it's been just a few minutes. But uh, <laughs> uh, yes, no, I'm very glad to have you back on. And I hope to have you back on after this much sooner than has been the case since the last time you were on. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there, there really is so much to go over uh, nowadays. I mean, it's just such a crazy, crazy period. But this is a Q&A episode, so if you have a reasonable and responsible question or comment for Luke and myself, please leave it via Streamlabs. I throw the link into the live chat as soon as I can. But please leave your stuff as soon as possible. Don't save it all for the end. Thank you very much. In advance. Uh, Luke, looking at us, uh, I mean, there are so many different things uh, to talk about. You sent me sort of like a, a list of some, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this as we're waiting for stuff to come in from the audience. But uh, there is a, a bit of a uh, dispute going on between Michael Anton, obviously a very prominent writer, and uh, paleoconservatism. He does not really care for it, even though he has a high opinion of my co host, Paul Goffrey. Uh, this is rather interesting because since Paul is arguably the most uh, public figure in paleoconservatism, you would think that, uh, you know, if Anton doesn't like paleoconservatism, he wouldn't necessarily have the highest opinion of Paul, but he has a very decent opinion of Paul, but he just doesn't like paleoconservatism. Uh, and Anton's take on why paleoconservatism is not a great thing certainly is uh, interesting, to say the absolute least. So, uh, Luke, what's your take on this Michael Anton v. Paleocon thing? Right. So it's interesting. Michael Anton says he's come around to the paleocon perspective on immigration, the paleocon perspective on trade, and the paleocon perspective on armed foreign interventions. So to me, those are the three most important political issues in the United States today. And so Michael Anton has shifted from the neoconservative or the conservative Inc position to the position of the paleocons on the three most important political issues of the day. So it seems to me everything after that is just secondary by, by definition. Like what's more important than immigration policy? To me, that's the most important issue. Then second most important issue, trade policy. So Anton's come around to the paleocon position on, on trade. And then Anton's come around to the paleocon position on uh, great reluctance for armed intervention overseas. So he then he then goes into great length about his differences with the paleocons over Abraham Lincoln and the importance of the Declaration of Independence and where were the founders wrong. And it, it just seems so bizarre to spend 95% of these very lengthy and often repetitive essays charging the paleocons with having the, the incorrect position with regard to the Declaration of Independence and the incorrect position with regard to Abraham Lincoln and incorrect positions with regard to the founders, it, that that just strikes me as incredibly bizarre. He, he's writing in 2021. He says that uh, the Republic is in grave danger, that the, the leftist hordes are at the gates and the leftist hordes, that, according to Anton, that you know they want to do away with everybody on the right. So we're in a time of great extremists. He acknowledges this. He begins his essays by saying we're in a very difficult, dangerous time. And he purports that he states at the beginning of his essay that he's writing it to try to bring the right wing together. And so this is such a bizarre thing that after that, that introduction, he then spends most of his space saying that uh, paleocons uh, like this uh, Brian, Brian guy, um, uh, Brian McClanahan. Yeah, yeah. Who, who you know may or may not be be a paleocon, but that that he has he has the wrong attitude towards the Declaration of Independence. It it just seems a world a world of bizarro. And I, now my main question for myself is: Was Anton always this way? Because I loved Anton's 
Flight 93 essay. I love that Anton back in 2016 was leading a cavalcade of intellectuals making the case for, for Trumpism. But, but now I'm starting to think maybe Anton hasn't changed. Maybe I've changed. And so maybe he was always in, in a overly theoretical or, or bizarre world, highly disconnected from reality. And it's just that when he said a few things that I, I resonated with, then, then I had this great esteem for him. So I'm starting to suspect that Anton hasn't changed. I, I'm concerned that, that it's just that I've changed because I, I don't understand. How do you understand this? He, Anton says he's come around to the paleo composition on, on these three most important issues, and he wants to unite the right, but then he spends thousands and thousands and thousands of words saying that the, the paleo cons aren't, aren't solid on Lincoln and the Declaration of Independence. How do you understand that? Uh, the whole thing to me is really uh, sort of disjointed. And I think that's the general uh, perspective that you have as well. Uh, I don't think that really paleoconservatism or America first is going to have much of an impact on America's future, on the United States' future, I should say. Uh, but uh, so I, know, I don't really, uh, I suppose, take this matter with the highest esteem, but I find it uh, to be bizarre, uh, his perspective here all the same. I really think that the whole matter boils down to paleoconservatism being thought of as something that uh, you can't say it's had its day. It never really did get its day uh, on America's political scene, but thought of as being antiquated and therefore it is not uh, utilizable. And you have, uh, you know, uh, this is not something I suppose is limited to Anton. Uh, the, the whole idea that not just paleoconservatism, but conservatism or the right moreover, which is not necessarily the conservative movement, uh, there is the notion that all of this is, is not worth having because it's past its sell-by date. And so you see people like Pedro Gonzalez, who I'm sure you're familiar with, he writes for American Greatness, uh, and he's basically a leftist. Uh, he he's, he's, uh, admires Leninism, he advocates socialist economics, and he calls himself a post-rightist, but he despises the woke left, and so he wants to essentially emulate the woke left by taking over the administrative state and having a nanny state that promotes a non, a based, if you will, form of socialism. Uh, so uh, Anton obviously is not advocating that, but uh, there is this general idea that what has come before on the right is no longer useful. And I think it's to a matter of degrees how a lot of people are rejecting this. You have people who essentially want to become non-modern lefty leftists like Pedro, and then you have people like Anton who are searching for something sort of viable in this age, which is still discernibly more right wing. Uh, anything to say about that? Yeah, I just, I, I'm trying to get get into Anton's mindset. I, I'm a big believer in historicism. So all of us, mm -hmm. we operate in a particular historical context and we are yeah. formed by certain uh, contexts and we we are reacting to certain things and we, we state things at a certain time and at a certain place. So Anton, being someone friendly with the Claremont Institute and with Hillsdale College, comes from institutions that have been feuding with paleocons for 30 years. So that, that has to explain it, that, that he comes from institutions that paleocons have, have a great deal of reservations about. And so he can't help. But, but see the world through this prism. I know when I talk to people from Claremont or from Hillsdale, mm -hmm. they just have a, generally speaking, a visceral loathing for, for paleocons and for yeah. Paul Godfrey that is beyond anything that I can comprehend. I mean, it's so intense that, mm -hmm. that I, I can't make sense of it. And I, don't, I can't make sense of someone who wants to go to war over differing interpretations of the Declaration of Independence. To me, the Declaration of Independence was a historical document produced by certain men who were influenced by certain philosophical ideas at the time. And it was not a document that was created for the founding of the United States. The United States was not founded. It evolved from various groups of Englishmen who moved to America and, and developed very much along English lines. And so the Declaration of Independence was a historical document that uh, the, the rebels in 1776 produced to make their case to the world. And so mm -hmm. this notion that all men are created equal, to me, it, I can find ways that that's true. I mean, I have to really, really work at it. 
but but if I want to understand something and and want to resonate with it, I can I can do the work and find ways where this statement is true. I just don't understand the 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 to me incredibly destructive passion to try to make this statement come true. You know, in 2021, in ever expanding ways, so that that it, it now covers the transgendered and you know every minority under the sun and life outcomes have to be equal. Otherwise, we're we're not living up to the doc Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence was a historical document produced by certain men living in history, reacting to ideas that were current at the time, that was speaking to an intellectual current at, at the time. And just like with George W. Bush and the 2003 invasion of Iraq, we, the United States did not go into Iraq in 2003 to find and disarm weapons of, nu of mass destruction. That was simply the most useful rhetorical device for justifying what the Bush administration already wanted to do. So we can't just take people's declarations and, and accept them as, as fact. I mean, declarations take place within a certain context. Saying that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction was thought to be the most useful rhetorical exercise. And so the Declaration of Independence is a rhetorical exercise to make an appeal to the world to explain what, what's going on. I, I, don't, I don't understand the idea that we then have to conform all of American life to try to fit in with the purported ideals encapsulated by the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously everything is a product of its time and place. Uh, it, it is very much an artifact of the uh, historical period in which it, uh, it has come about. And I think that very, very frequently that is disregarded, uh, either because people are historically illiterate because they want to do it for their own, you know, personal reasons, for their own convenience, or because people simply don't think to really look at the bigger picture. But in any case, it's not good. And uh, people really should be more cognizant of the historical background of something that they, uh, that they quote or something that they use for reference in the present day. No two ways about that. So anyway, uh, actually, there are a few more other, there were not a few more, <laughs> that doesn't make sense, but there were a few other interesting things which Luke brought up to discuss. I will check Streamlabs in a minute. I will just say that if you have a reasonable, responsible question or comment from Luke or myself, please do leave it via Streamlabs and we will get to it. Thank you very much in advance. But, uh, you know, Luke, I think that uh, something else you brought up, which is uh, interesting, is the New York Times. Uh, you mentioned to me that you subscribe to these major newspapers, even though you know that they're on the left, and you find them valuable. But at the same time, uh, it's in a discriminatory sense, uh, and I, I, that I do find I, I find really fascinating. So uh, please do tell me, how does one read the New York Times? What's your take on that? Right. So I don't understand how any intelligent person who's interested in the world around him is not going to find several articles worth reading every day in the New York Times. And it doesn't matter if you're to the right of Attila the Hun, you're a centrist, or, or you're on the left. There's lots of fascinating material in there. Now, people then say to me, Luke, how can you read the New York Times? How can you subscribe to the New York Times? How can you give the New York Times credit when they bought into the Russian collusion hoax? That's only one tiny aspect of the New York Times. It's like saying, Luke, how can I take you seriously? Because in sixth grade, you used to make a lot of really rude noises in class. And in sixth grade, I used to sometimes eat ants. And I used to pull the, the pigtails of girls. And even today, I, I say and do embarrassing things. Like, everyone can be dismissed if you just focus on, on, on one thing. That's something I, I noticed just a human tendency. We're just wired to try to dismiss people and institutions because it's so reality is so confusing. We just want to boil things down. So we just dismiss, for example, the, the New York Times because they made the Russian collusion hoax the top story for three years, and, and it turned out to be nothing. But I, I don't read the New York Times for the uh, for its ranking of what's important in, in the world today. I, I was never able to read anything about the Russian collusion hoax without starting to get a headache. I mean, I would genuinely try to read these articles about how Trump colluded with, with Russia to rig the 2016 election, and my mind would just... Uh, it would just get fuzzy and, and start to hurt because it just didn't make any sense. So I, I don't read the New York Times for that. I, I don't read the New York Times, obviously, for its woke op-eds. But 
I mean, the New York Times sometimes publishes Christopher Cordwell. He, he's an amazingly insightful thinker. And a lot of it's cultural coverage, book coverage, uh, overseas coverage. I mean, if you're going to trash the New York Times, then tell me a better newspaper. What's a better source of news than the New York Times? Foxnews.com? Come on, get real. The New York Times has something like 1,200 you know, very smart, intelligent, generally left-wing journalists. But I would much rather hear from someone who's smart and on the left than someone who's a midwit and on the right. So they've got more journalists than any other news outlet of which I'm aware. They produce more thoughtful content than any other newspaper of which I'm aware. What's better than the New York Times if you want to read a, a daily, constantly updated source of information? It's, it's, I think it's still better than the Wall Street Journal, which I also subscribe to. I mean, where else are you going to get your news from, from Twitter? I mean, Joseph, do you, do you read the New York Times? I do from time to time. I read many different news sources. A great deal of them are on the left. Uh, some are on the right. Uh, I, I don't take any of them necessarily very seriously unless I think that what they say is self-evidently true, which is to say that there's been some sort of evidence provided to corroborate it. I generally perceive nowadays news articles as being opinion pieces, even when they're not labeled as such, just because bias has grown so rampant in this day and age. But I mean, once you know, like once you know, for example, I, I'm I'm right wing. So for me, uh, I, I regard inequality as natural, and uh, I, I believe that uh, people are built built with uh, different skills, different proclivities. I don't believe that we're born a blank slate. Once you know where I'm coming from, then whatever someone else's perspective is, they can kind of deal w with me. And I know the New York Times is overwhelmingly an institution of the left, but I can, if I want information i can i can detect it. it i don't see why it's so difficult for people to take what is good whether it's from the new york times or, or richard spencer or howard stern or uh the nbc pre sunday night football program once you put people or institutions or 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 radio stations in their proper genre then you can deal with them richard spencer he's a provocateur he's always looking to be edgy he's always looking to be the center of attention he always looking to surprise you with what he has to say so when you realize that richard spencer is a shock jock with more elevated vocabulary then he never has to disappoint you ben shapiro he takes the most conservative positions possible even if he knows absolutely nothing about what he's talking about he's going to talk very rapidly with the most conservative position in his understanding possible and so ben shapiro need never disappoint you once you put institutions and people in their proper genre then then you can read them to to your benefit i i don't read my electricity bill the same way that i read the torah and i don't read the torah uh, the same way i read uh, my health insurance information versus the way i read a sext right if some you know some woman sending me a, a picture of herself in a bikini uh, and, and then adds a few words to that. I don't read that the same way that uh, I, I read the book of Leviticus. Like you have to understand everything in its proper genre. The New York Times is a left-wing publication. That's his genre. I, I understand that. And then I, I read it accordingly, just like I don't want to start reading the electricity bill the same way that I read this you know, text from an alluring woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I refuse to pay for news, uh, for print news nowadays. So I read whatever uh, I'm allowed to read without you know, getting a subscription. But I think that you're correct that you have to read different things in different ways. And, you know, obviously context is key there as it is with anything else in life. So I think that when one looks at the news, one should really consider what is it that you seek to find. You want to be more informed about current events, regardless of the politics of them or the political implications of them, or are you looking to have your political views reinforced? Unfortunately, now many uh, in the in the American news market, which is, say those who consume news, are looking for the latter. They want to have their views reinforced, and so publications are responding to that. And I think that if one is to read news in its proper context. One's going to have to take into account, regardless of whichever source it is that he or she reads or listens to or watches, whatever, that uh, it's going to be biased because that's just where the tenor of the country is right now in terms of uh, getting the news which it wants. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all we're all flawed. Like, it's mm -hmm. like hating on 40 here because I'm not Paul Gottfried. I'm not Paul Gottfried. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know German. I don't know some of the languages he knows. I don't have his body of scholarly work, but I know a heck of a lot more about the pornography industry than, than poor Gottfried. So, <laughs> like, I mean, it's like hating on Joseph Cotto because he's not Howard Stern. Well, you don't set out to be Howard Stern. That's maybe not in your in your talent stack. It's like mm. hating your gardener because he hasn't studied Martin Buber. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's uh. ridiculous. It's like, you know, oh, I've got so much rage for my rabbi because he knows nothing about Augustine. But why would you expect your rabbi to, to know about Augustine? Or it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I'm just, you know, I'm ready to divorce my wife because she knows nothing about Keynesian economics. I mean, mm -hmm. once you put people in their proper genre, they, they cease disappointing you and you can start appreciating them for what they, they bring to the table. Most people bring, bring something to the table, but we only get disappointed when we expect more from people than they're able to give. No, I agree entirely. Everything must be placed in its context, as you ably said. Now let me check stream 